You've heard a lot of uh, excellent presentations, um, and now it's time to uh, dial it down a little bit and hear a plumber's perspective on uh, venothromboembolic disease. I have no uh, uh, financial disclosures uh, regarding this presentation. Uh, when I think of uh, DVT, pulmonary embolism, from a, a standpoint of endovascular or catheter-based minimally invasive therapies, I always uh, try to stratify uh, patients who present with these uh, problems into those who present with an acute venothromboembolic event, uh, which is characterized by uh, symptoms um, of less than 14 days in duration, or uh, rather fresh thrombus, and those who uh, we characterize as having chronic venoocclusive disease, uh, that is, symptoms and clinical findings that uh, have been occurring for longer than 14 days. And uh, in a way, this makes sense because a fresh thrombus may be more amenable to certain catheter-based therapies and uh, uh, medication infusions, uh, whereas a chronic uh, thrombus, an organized thrombus, which becomes rubbery and hard, like the sole of uh, a sneaker, for example, uh, is a much harder uh, beast to, uh, to deal with in terms of uh, our um, uh, endovascular tools. And then looking at the acute venothromboembolic um, uh, events, uh, we, of course, have acute pulmonary embolism on the left. Uh, we deal with patients with upper extremity deep vein thrombosis, and these can be uh, related to a uh, paget schroeder uh, or effort thrombosis. They can be related to pick lines or other um, uh, catheters uh, used uh, for drug delivery in patients with cancer, for example, and they also can be related to uh, pacemaker leads. We then, of course, have patients with lower extremity DVT, probably the most uh, common um, patient subset we deal with. And those can be related to uh, uh, thrombosis of the iliofemoral vein or sometimes uh, due to uh, external uh, compression of the vein by uh, abdominal or pelvic tumor, for example. And then, a little bit less frequently, uh, we can have patients with thrombosis of the inferior vena cava or superior vena cava, the two ma main veins that drain um, the uh, venous blood from the lower and the upper part of the body, respectively, uh, directly into the, uh, into the heart. And uh, uh, because of the relative frequency, I, I will uh, concentrate on um, uh, discussing endovascular interventions in patients with lower extremity uh, DVT. Now, patients with chronic uh, venous disease are usually those who have developed uh, uh, deep vein thrombosis in the past. Uh, they were managed with uh, anticoagulation, or maybe the event was missed altogether, and now, months or years later, present with some clinical consequences and symptoms uh, of uh, venous occlusion. And those can be patients with um, uh, uh, SVC syndrome or uh, stenosis or occlusion of the superior vena cava, which uh, leads to impediment of uh, venous drainage from the upper part of the body, leading to facial swelling, upper extremity swelling. Uh, you have patients with lower extremity iliofemoral occlusion, uh, and those patients present with um, uh, swelling in the legs, that is chronic, uh, skin changes, venous ulcers, um, uh, or um, uh, discomfort uh, with ambulation. And then, of course, uh, patients with chronic venous scarring or occlusion in the upper extremity, usually related to uh, pacemaker ICD leads um, or um, uh, uh, lines that are used for a drug infusion. Um, the the uh, primary reason that uh, endovascular or catheter-based therapies are used, are used in patients with lower extremity um, uh, deep vein thrombosis um, is the uh, attempt to prevent a post-thrombotic syndrome, which is characterized as uh, uh, swelling, uh, uh, skin changes, discomfort, um, related to uh, Im impaired venous drainage uh, as a result of an occluded vein uh, from a deep vein uh, thrombosis. This is a, a very morbid condition and a source of a tremendous um, uh, uh, decrement in quality of life to many uh, patients. Uh, as you have heard from uh, Dr. Piazza, the immediate goals of deep vein thrombosis therapy are, of course, um, uh, related to uh, 
prevention of clot extension into pulmonary embolism, prevention of recurrent venothromboembolic uh, uh, events, uh, diminishment of uh, severity and duration of limb uh, symptoms, and of course prevention of post-thrombotic syndrome. And anticoagulation is the primary uh, intervention here, but it's important to keep in mind that anticoagulation frequently does not restore vein patency, um, though it prevents thrombus progression. And there is a school of thought that maybe if you remove the thrombus from the vein, reconstituted its patency, you would prevent some of these downstream sequela and consequences of chronic venous occlusion. It's also important to keep in mind that uh, not all deep vein uh, thromboses are the same. And so patients with uh, a DVT in the distal veins below the knee or even patients um, uh, are symptomatically much uh, different from patients with a more proximal deep vein thrombosis or patients with uh, occlusion and clot in the veins above the knee. It's also important to further subdivide uh, these patients because this uh, category of proximal DVT uh, uh, can be divided into patients with iliofemoral DVT or occlusion of the iliac and femoral vein right on top of the leg. As you, as you can imagine, patients with deep vein thrombosis at this level have the capacity to develop collateral or detour uh, veins that drain the leg. Um, uh, the veins are, are smaller in caliber. It's more likely that they will recanalize. Uh, whereas the veins up here, uh, the ability to develop collateral drainage um, and recanalize these veins is much lower. And uh, this is the, the final pathway for drainage of the entire lower limb. And as you can, as you can imagine, a blockage here uh, is of much lower consequence uh, than a blockage here, which impairs drainage from the entire leg. Uh, and so patients with iliofemoral DVT, in addition to anticoagulation, uh, are very attractive candidates for more advanced therapies uh, therapies uh, aimed at removal of thrombus uh, to uh, restore patency and um, uh, uh, prevent some of these downstream sequela, uh, particularly the post-thrombotic uh, syndrome. Uh, some of the most common causes of iliofemoral DVT uh, is uh, are related to, uh, obviously, uh, garden variety uh, DVT related to a hypercoagulable syndrome. And May Thurner syndrome is um, a, a phenomenon where uh, the right common iliac vein crossing um, uh, from the left sided uh, aortic course to the right leg uh, compresses the left common iliac vein, which comes from the left leg and aims to come to the right side to join to the other side. Uh, to form the IVC. And that compression by, by a pulsating uh, right common iliac artery um, uh, re, uh, engenders scarring and stricture formation in the uh, common iliac vein, which then predisposes patients to um, occlusion uh, and thrombosis. A particularly feared uh, uh, condition is uh, called phlegmasia cerulea dolens, and that is uh, such extensive uh, uh, thrombosis of the veins in the lower extremity that um, the uh, arterial inflow is uh, uh, impeded uh, because of poor outflow, and these patients uh, present with a limb and life-threatening um, uh, manifestations of this condition. We've learned from experience that administration of uh, systemic thrombolysis from a, a faraway uh, IV uh, plays, it, it's not very effective in uh, uh, reducing the thrombus burden in the veins in the arms or in the legs. Uh, that has been uh, studied extensively and uh, carries a risk of bleeding and really it's not effective at delivering the drug, the clot busting drug, to the uh, thrombus. Uh, what we use instead is uh, a series or several types of catheters which are uh, very uh, in a, uh, of very small caliber. They have multiple holes along its, its length. You can place this catheter in the, in the vein um, uh, top to bottom along uh, the length of the thrombus and then through all these little uh, side holes you can um, uh, infuse a clot dissolving medication which um, can be administered at a much lower dose than the systemic thrombolysis, lower risk of bleeding, higher efficacy, um, and a higher rate of uh, clearing, uh, dissolving the uh, thrombus. There are many other uh, catheter-based devices uh, which can be used to remove thrombus uh, acutely. 
Uh, one of these devices, for example, is the AngioJet, uh, AngioJet thrombectomy catheter, which uses um, a, a, a Venturi principle to create a suction vo uh, 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 vortex here to suck out some of the fresh thrombus. It can also be used to spray the thrombus forcefully with the clot-busting medication. As you can imagine, this works very well in fresh clot um, and mu is much less um, effective in uh, organized thrombus or old thrombus. There are other devices. Uh, this trellis catheter, for example, can be placed along the length uh, of the occluded vein. You can in, in inflate two balloons, um, which uh, uh, reduce the risk that the blood clot will break up and travel to the lungs during the intervention. And then um, on the, uh, in between these balloons, you can infuse a, a thrombolytic. You have uh, this segment of the catheter, which can spin um, and macerate, break up the clot, so it's uh, much more susceptible to the uh, thrombolytic. And then it can be aspirated uh, and removed be before the balloons are um, uh, deflated. Another uh, uh, technique uh, becoming increasingly popular is the use of ultrasound to assist uh, the uh, thrombolytic action uh, of um, uh, some of these uh, medications. And uh, this basically entails um, the usage of a catheter which in addition to these multiple side holes through which the thrombolytic can be infused, also has along its length spaced out ultrasound transducers which emit ultrasound energy, which loosen up the, uh, the thrombus and make it much more susceptible to the medication, allowing uh, a much lower dose of thrombolytic, a much shorter duration of the therapy, and um, a much, uh, a much more cost-effective uh, treatment and much safer in terms of uh, bleeding. And this is one of uh, such catheters. You can see here um, a, a catheter that has these uh, transducers spaced evenly emitting ultrasound. Uh, in between here are little side holes which uh, allow infusion of the uh, clot dissolving uh, medication. Uh, in the past, uh, we've used the, some of these strategies um, um, based on clinical experience, uh, experience from multiple uh, registries that have shown that these procedures in selected patients may be indeed efficacious and, uh, and beneficial. We are now in an era where we have more randomized control uh, trials, uh, which are uh, designed to answer the question whether these more advanced therapies in patients with iliofemoral deep vein thrombosis are indeed beneficial long term in terms of preventing the post-thrombotic syndrome in uh, improving the quality of life. Um, and the first trial uh, recently published uh, out of uh, Norway, the Cavent trial, attempted to answer just that question. Uh, the investigators randomized patients with iliofemoral deep vein thrombosis and treated them with standard uh, treatment, that is anticoagulation, or um, uh, randomized uh, half of these patients to additional advanced therapy, uh, by which I mean catheter-directed uh, thrombolysis through one of those catheters. And they have documented uh, that uh, this uh, more advanced therapy was indeed uh, safe and was uh, associated with an absolute risk reduction of 14% uh, in terms of the post-thrombotic syndrome uh, uh, in, in follow-up. Uh, so, uh, very early data, but, but promising. In the United States, uh, a similar, uh, a larger but similar trial is the NIH-sponsored ATTRACT trial, which is also aiming uh, to answer the question whether these advanced therapies in uh, patients with iliofemoral DVT are as effective and beneficial as uh, many of us uh, believe. Again, it's very important to select the right patient for this procedure. These are usually highly functional young patients um, or middle-aged patients with um, iliofemoral DVT and an acceptable risk of potential uh, uh, bleeding complications. The societal guidelines regarding these interventions are a little bit more conservative. The American College of Chest Physicians uh, uh, recommends that all patients uh, should be treated with um, uh, anticoagulation, of course, but um, uh, uh, and that uh, uh, standard uh, widespread use of these advanced therapies uh, may uh, uh, not be uh, uh, cost effective or uh, or safe uh, when used indiscriminately for all uh, patients.
The American Heart Association, on the other hand, believes that um, uh, judicious use of these therapies in patients who have a low risk of bleeding is a reasonable uh, uh, first-line treatment um, when the goal of PTS, or post-thrombotic syndrome prevention, is kept in mind. Uh, and so just a quick, quick case um, uh, to illustrate this, a 60-year-old woman with acute left leg swelling and pain after ankle surgery and several days of immobilization. Uh, this patient had ultrasound evidence of uh, femoral vein thrombosis, and because of her symptoms, we suspected iliac vein thrombosis as well. Uh, this is the thigh bone, and a catheter is placed uh, behind the knee in the popliteal vein. You can see the injection of contrast. This is a nice and open vein here, and then it's the flow of contrast stops rap, uh, uh, abruptly, and you, you can see that uh, this, uh, or you can uh, imagine that the vein here is filled up with uh, thrombus all the way to the groin area, and even uh, higher up, uh, uh, there's no contrast flow up to the abdomen because uh, this whole uh, iliac segment is thrombosed. And after the use of catheter-directed thrombolysis, uh, the vein in the thigh and in the groin area is uh, now open, and you can see contrast flowing all the way up. And this patient, you can see here, has an open iliac vein, but the contrast flow still stops right uh, at the level of the belly button where this uh, left uh, common iliac vein should be joining the right common iliac vein to form the inferior vena cava. Uh, and you can then maybe appreciate on a, on a close-up that this vein is narrowed here, and when we try to open it up with a balloon, you can see that the balloon here, uh, trying to stretch the vein, is constricted in the middle, and this is because there's a, a, a narrowing, a scar, um, caused by the May-Thurner syndrome, uh, caused by uh, compression of this venous segment by the right iliac artery that is crossing over to the right leg. And that, of course, can be stented, and the vein can be uh, opened up, and this patient has a rather rapid resolution of swelling, um, improvement um, in her mobility, uh, and her risk of post-thrombotic syndrome is therefore uh, uh, lowered uh, significantly. Similar therapies can be used for patients with chronic venous occlusion. Um, this is, for example, a patient who was um, uh, diagnosed with iliofemoral DVT but treated with standard anticoagulation, and some of these patients uh, down the road return with a lot of leg edema, uh, venous ulcers, venous uh, uh, claudication or discomfort with walking, uh, and you can see here that uh, the vein here is um, uh, occluded or, or, or blocked, and the v drainage uh, takes place via detours or collaterals. And with a little bit of, uh, of luck, uh, uh, these veins can be uh, opened up with balloons and stents, and the uh, blood flow can be uh, reconstituted and the symptoms can be ameliorated. Uh, moving on quickly uh, uh, to uh, catheter-based therapies for pulmonary embolism. Uh, we have a little bit less data here to guide us, but this is a very exciting area. Uh, where um, many uh, research uh, efforts are now underway to define whether catheter-based interventions uh, can be effective in helping patients with uh, massive or uh, submassive uh, pulmonary uh, embolism. Uh, we know that there are certain advantages to endovascular therapy. It's widely available, even in smaller community hospitals. It's uh, less invasive and rapidly available. Uh, but there are also some um, uh, downsides to that as well. We know that uh, many of our tools and devices are designed for smaller arteries. Uh, the pulmonary arteries are quite large. And uh, we also know that very frequently we are unable to remove all of the thrombus from the pulmonary arteries, uh, recognizing, however, that sometimes all we need to do is remove a little bit of it to restore blood flow into the lungs, uh, reverse right ventricular failure, and uh, get the patients to feel better um, and do better. We know from uh, some retrospective analyses that uh, catheter-based interventions um, do play a role in patients with massive pulmonary embolism. We can therefore um, consider these patients to be candidates potentially for systemic thrombolysis, surgical embolectomy, and in selective, uh, selected patients in selected uh, situations also for uh, catheter-based therapies. But these patients uh, are uh, uh, constitute a smaller uh, part of the PE spectrum. And um, the largest group, of course, uh, that we would like to 
consider for advanced therapies are patients with submassive pulmonary embolism, those who are relatively stable, but in whom the heart is under uh, duress, where the right ventricle is um, strained, and we c we're concerned about their long-term cardiopulmonary health, risk of right ventricular failure and pulmonary hypertension. And so the question is, can a, a catheter-mediated rapid restoration of right ventricular function um, uh, instituted rapidly, can that affect patients down the road, get them uh, out of the hospital faster, and reduce um, uh, some decrement in cardiopulmonary function? And there are indeed some observational studies to, that suggest that if um, we treat patients with submassive pulmonary embolism with systemic thrombolysis, aiming to reduce a lot of the uh, thrombotic burden in the pulmonary artery and relieve the strain of the, uh, on the right ventricle, we can down the road see that their functional capacity um, is markedly improved compared to patients who are treated more conservatively. Uh, that, of course, comes at the risk of a, a higher bleeding risk. Uh, but uh, uh, when uh, studied more rigorously, uh, we can show that a lot of these patients do uh, uh, um, indeed have a, a long-term benefit in terms of their functional capacity, reduction in uh, the risk of pulmonary hypertension, um, and ability to uh, exercise. So the concept of uh, uh, using um, a, a system or therapy where you can deliver the clot-dissolving medication at a much lower uh, dose to reduce the bleeding risk. Uh, and if you can deliver it directly into the thrombus in the pulmonary artery, you may um, uh, uh, reduce it more uh, effectively, the thrombus that is, at a lower uh, risk of bleeding. And so again, uh, there is a, a lot of interest in uh, delivering um, or, or using uh, ultrasound emitting catheters, which also uh, um, uh, allow infusion of clot dissolving uh, medications directly into the thrombus um, in the pulmonary artery. And there's um, uh, early data showing that patients with right ventricular strain, uh, as measured on CT, which you have uh, seen in Dr. Piazza's presentation, where there was enlargement of the right ventricle relative to the left ventricle, institution of uh, such catheter-based therapy uh, reduces the right ventricular size, indicating that the strain on the right ventricle is reduced uh, quite uh, rapidly. And uh, we hope that that transmits into long-term uh, functional benefit to these patients, and though that is now a subject of several uh, large-scale uh, studies. In our experience, we can show that uh, uh, our patients with submassive PE who undergo such therapies have a rather rapid reduction in pulmonary arterial pressure within 13 hours uh, of such therapy, indicating that the blood flow through the lungs um, is improved and that the thrombotic burden is uh, diminished. Remarkably, these patients turn around very quickly. Their oxygen demand is reduced. They feel much better uh, within uh, 24 hours. Um, some of uh, that is uh, easy to see uh, when you look um, at the pulmonary angiograms before and after such procedure. This is a catheter going from the uh, neck vein uh, placed under local anesthetic going through the heart and into the pulmonary artery. And this is a patient whose right pulmonary artery is completely blocked by a big pulmonary embolism, big clot. You can see that this lung is not getting any of the contrast flowing into it because it's completely blocked. Uh, after instituting uh, such therapy and using about 20% of the clot dissolving medication that would be used uh, with systemic thrombolysis, um, uh, I'll show you in a second uh, that this uh, patient uh, can be uh, uh, rapidly uh, restored to a ra uh, normal perfusion in the right lung. This patient had elevated pulmonary pressures and elevated pressures in the right heart, uh, not unexpectedly. And then placement of uh, such um, uh, ultrasound and uh, drug uh, infu uh, emitting and infusing uh, catheters uh, after uh, 18 or 13 hours of, um, of infusion uh, of the thrombolytic and uh, emitting uh, of ultrasound, you can see that now this pulmonary artery, which was previously completely blocked, is now open. Uh, there's much improved blood flow to the lung. Not perfect. There's still some uh, thrombi here, uh, but this is a, a vast improvement, and this patient did not only had an improvement in the pulmonary pressures, right ventricular function, but also felt better. And so the uh, 
the concept that uh, acute pulmonary embolism can be treated through minimally invasive endovascular uh, means is now firmly on the map. There is a lot of research ongoing um, to make sure that this is um, indeed something that has long-term uh, benefit to our patients. Uh, the so societal guidelines are much more receptive to um, using these uh, therapies in selected patients. Again, uh, these patients um, have to have just the right mix of disease and, um, and a sufficiently low uh, bleeding risk to be considered for this. But in our experience, uh, we have um, uh, instituted a, a system where these patients with submassive and massive pulmonary embolism uh, are rapidly assessed uh, for uh, uh, candidacy for these advanced therapies. And by those, I mean either intravenous thrombolysis, surgical removal of clot from the pulmonary artery, or uh, catheter-based uh, therapies. Uh, and uh, we treat them uh, in a way uh, that's similar to uh, the strategies that we uh, use for patients with heart attacks, uh, where some of these patients are managed medically, uh, some of them undergo uh, immediate surgery or, or catheter-based uh, angioplasties, and uh, more and more venothromboembolic disease, specifically pulmonary embolism, is indeed um, becoming very similar to uh, uh, acute arterial di uh, disease, uh, mirroring the uh, concept that Dr. Piazza mentioned um, a few moments ago. Uh, I will uh, stop here.